Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Zoom today. I know it can be a lot asking everybody to come on to these conversations, given the amount of time we all spend um, on this application. But I think we can look forward to a really robust and interesting discussion um, on a super pertinent topic. So my name is Connor. I'm co-president of the Tufts Middle East Research Group, which is an IGL affiliated club. Um, I would like to thank, uh, before we start this, the IGL for all their logistical support, especially Stacy in helping us set up this webinar. Um, and as we move on, I'd also like to thank our panelists for taking the time out of their day to join us. In, on August 13th, 2020, the UAE and the United States agreed in a joint statement to um, operationalize the Abraham Accords Peace Agreement Treaty of Peace, Diplomatic Relations, and Full Normalization between the United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel, wherein the United Arab Emirates became the third Arab country and the first since 1994 to normalize dipl diplomatic relations with Israel. Today, we are joined by Ariella Steinreich and Ambassador Marin Rubin, two individuals with impressive backgrounds and unique perspectives on the Accords, here to discuss with us some of the most important aspects of the Accords and what the future might hold for Arab-Israeli relations and the political economy of the Middle East as a result of this historic agreement. Leila Farisakh of UMass Boston was supposed to join us um, on this webinar today, but I was notified that she had a family emergency and unfortunately will not be able to attend today. Um, now I'll move on to introducing the speakers and then we'll invite them to give opening remarks of about four minutes before moving into moderated Q&A. Um, for all the attendees and participants, make sure to drop your questions into the Q&A function of the webinar and we'll get to those questions at the end after, uh, after moderated Q&A is finished. Arielle Steinreich is a prominent communications professional and strategic advisor in the United States and the Middle East. She's head of the Middle East Division for Steinreich Communications, a multinational public relations firm where she creates and implements global communications and media relations programs for leading companies and organizations. She's also a founding member of the UAE Israel Business Council and a founding member of the Gulf Israel Women's Forum. Ariel Steinreich has a long track record of um, work in strategic media counseling, media training, communications, strategic strategy development, social media strategy, crisis communications, issues management, financial communications, and corporate social responsibility. She serves on the boards of several nonprofits and is active in a range of cultural, educational, and social impact initiatives in addition to her professional work. Ambassador Marin Rubin is the Consul General of Israel to New England. He has a diplomatic career spanning over three decades during which he had served in various positions, including roles at the Israeli embassies in Chile and Mexico, and as ambassador to Paraguay, Bolivia, and Colombia. Ambassador Rubin serves as, um, served as Israel's ambassador to the UN between 2010 and 2011, as well as Israel's chief of state protocol from 2015 to 2020. In this post, he was the go-to foreign ministry official responsible for diplomats and visiting world dignitaries. At the end of his tenure, he was behind the scenes when leaders from the United Arab Emirates made a historic visit to Israel as part of the Abraham Accords in 2020. Ambassador Rubin was born in South Africa in 1961 and immigrated to Israel from the UK in 1974, where he studied dip diplomacy and international relations at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. During his military service, Ambassador Rubin was an air traffic controller in the Israeli Air Force. Ms. Steinreich, I would now invite you to make your opening remarks, and then followed by Ambassador Rubin. Well, thank you all for having me today. It's, it's really wonderful to speak with you. I'm, I'm privileged to speak with many groups around the world about the Abraham Accords, and I think what makes me most excited um, is to speak with uh, college students and alumni who really, this is the Accords are made for you. The Accords were created now, but it's to create a better future um, for, for all of us, including the future generation um, of, of business leaders, government officials, and, and, and the like. So um, it's really my privilege to be here today. I think that the Abraham Accords are different than any other peace accords we've seen um, so far that Israel has with its, its Arab neighbors. It's really built on warm peace. I can tell you I've been uh, to the UAE and to Bahrain 
before the accords and afterwards. And there's such a different vibe in the streets. I mean, you're seeing, you know, I was there for Hanukkah and you saw Emiratis singing Hanukkah songs and lighting the menorah. Um, I was just there for Purim in, in Bahrain and we had local Bahrainis coming and baking homintashin. It's, it's a whole new world um, and it's really, really exciting to be part of. And I think that the possibilities are, are endless. Um, you know, some of the, the ways we're already seeing a lot of these MOUs being signed and everything from healthcare to, um, to education. You know, we have some universities that are now gonna be partnering together um, to FinTech and, and kind of everything in between. And so it's a very exciting time in that respect. And I guess the big question that I always get is, you know, um, I do a lot of work with other GCC countries and where do they stand and are they next? And the reality is, is that there's a domino effect at play here. You know, once you have the first, once you have the second, yeah, others do want to come to the table. And it's, it's a process, but we'll get there. And it's a really, it's very exciting in that respect. So um, I thank you for these, you know, few moments, but it's really my, I, I'd love to give the time to, to the ambassador, you know, who plays a, a much more pivotal role. So I'll turn it to him. Thank you very much, Ariella. Uh, and uh, I prefer to be called Mehron. Uh, titles, uh, as I like to say, come and go, and one ends up uh, being yourself in the end. So I think that that's uh, the most important, uh, the important part. Uh, I can only agree with you. I think uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, the normalization agreements, I don't know whether it is a, an actual peace agreement, because I don't remember us really being at war with uh, Bahrain or the United Arab Emirates. Uh, but um, yeah, we definitely would call it a normalization uh, agreement uh, and agreements. Uh, uh, I think it's very, very difficult to, to underestimate how uh, important they, uh, they are and uh, where it takes uh, the, uh, the Middle East, I think, uh, and not only the Middle East, uh, I think the Middle East, North Africa and, and, the, whole, and the whole area. Uh, first and foremost, it's it's wonderful to be with you uh, today. Uh, I'm relatively new. I arrived uh, on thank on Thanksgiving, uh, and went immediately into quarantine. Uh, and so, uh, so yes, I've been here for some three months, and and working on Zoom sometimes is a little bit difficult uh, because I'd very much have preferred to be with you, with you in person. I hope that that will happen soon. Uh, I had to fly to Israel about two weeks ago, uh, and so uh, I immediately got uh, vaccinated uh, the moment I got there. Uh, which uh, was, uh, as you have most probably been reading in the press, the, the rollout is, is quite uh, impressive. Uh, but uh, going back to, of course, uh, the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords have, uh, have uh, focused uh, once again the world on, uh, uh, on what is going on in the Middle East. Uh, I think that it has uh, shaken up uh, the, the Middle East and uh, uh, made the the uh, a movement or future movement on uh, what is going on in the Middle East as something, I think it's the first time really, as, uh, as was mentioned in, uh, in practically 30 years that we've seen uh, such an advancement in the relationship between uh, Israel and its neighbors and Israel and, its, uh, and the region. Uh, and I think that what we're going to see, uh, as uh, was mentioned uh, by Ariella, is that we're going to be moving into a different phase uh, of uh, the, uh, the conflict, though I don't know whether I'd like to call it a conflict. It's maybe uh, it's something, it's something uh, else. Uh, on top of that, uh, of course, um, one is seeing uh, uh, maybe what uh, uh, I think the most one of the more important points is that um, things are being done above board, uh, whereas uh, previously uh, there were a lot of things that were said behind the scenes and never uh, actually focused on and and pointed towards. But uh, the the uh, coming together of uh, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Israel and Bahrain, Israel and Sudan, Israel and Morocco. Uh, on top of the uh, peace agreements and the diplomatic relations that we do have uh, both with Egypt and uh, Jordan uh, is I think going to uh, force uh, our neighbors, the Palestinians, uh, whether they like it or not, uh, to maybe uh, think slightly differently about uh, how to uh, go about uh, dealing with us and uh, the impasse that we've had 
uh, for so long might even be shaken up and we might be moving uh, towards uh, um, uh, another, another period. Uh, uh, I think a very good period and I hope uh, a very peaceful period uh, for uh, the region. Uh, so I think with that, I will, I will start and uh, please, uh, Connor, I think uh, you are mediating. Yeah, so I'm actually going to turn it over to my um, colleague and friend, Zach, now. He will begin the moderated Q&A with you guys. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Ambassador Maron, I'd like, like to start with you. So you mentioned um, uh, how the accord kind of came together in your eyes and how things were said behind the scenes um, for a few years leading up to this. So I'd love for you to talk about how it came about and like from your perspective in the Israeli Foreign Service and what was happening behind the scenes in Israel leading up to it? Well, as as was mentioned, and as I as I noted beforehand, uh, 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 there's always been quite a lot of activity uh, between Israel and uh, and its uh, Arab neighbors. Uh, I mean, you can see that even in the uh, uh, to before the. Uh, 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 before the uh, independence of the state of Israel in 1948, uh, our leaders uh, 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 then also went and uh, spoke to uh, the the uh, leadership in the uh, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, then, of course, even when we were officially at war with Jordan, uh, we had uh, members of uh, the cabinet um, uh, moving across and being in contact with uh, people in Jordan. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, there is this behind the scenes talk that, that has gone, gone on uh, for, for quite some time. I, I even mentioned that I uh, personally uh, had been uh, in the Emirates uh, some uh, 14, 15 years ago um, uh, on a trip uh, that was requested uh, by the United Arab Emirates. So, so uh, I think that, and also as, as ambassadors to the United Nations, uh, whereby uh, we actually found that it was, uh, um, even though uh, we were chastised uh, in the United Nations, uh, a lot of the countries uh, came to us uh, and requested uh, cooperation or uh, 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 focusing in. So uh, when we go to the uh, Abraham Accords, this is something that had, uh, without the, I think, without the United States uh, focus on, on the accords and looking for a different way uh, to, to move forward in the Middle East. I don't know whether we would have had uh, such a breakout in August of, uh, of last year, uh, but at the same time, uh, there has uh, been a steady a stream of uh, connections uh, between uh, um, Israel and uh, the, uh, quite a lot of countries in the Middle East. Uh, but with the um, uh, the help and the uh, and and the pushing of uh, uh, the United States diplomacy, uh, I think what we've seen is uh, first and foremost putting uh, pen to paper uh, and and having an official uh, agreement uh, and uh, and the meetings that have taken place. There's uh, we we uh, often don't always know, but uh, I think that Israel and uh, quite a lot of the uh, Sunni uh, um, Muslim states have. Uh, an agenda that uh, definitely sees eye to eye uh, on quite a few uh, subjects, uh, and uh, and uh, what is going on in the in the Middle East, I think, is something that uh, is maybe we are the accords have uh, put onto the table uh, a sort of new alliance. Uh, I would like to say uh, of uh, Israel. Uh, filling in a position in the Middle East, which uh, maybe it should have been doing uh, many years ago, and uh, that is to be part and parcel uh, of the Middle East. And I think that this is something that is, is really uh, very, very uh, impressive. Um, uh, delegations uh, and uh, talks uh, were, of course, uh, uh, begun uh, by the United States to try and, and get the, uh, the accords uh, uh, into um, uh, into focus, there was of course the hesitancy of one country not being, uh, not wanting to be the only country to to sign an agreement with uh, uh, with uh, with Israel, and so the necessity to bring other countries on board, 
Uh, and I think that this is also important because uh, there, of course, is uh, criticism uh, from uh, certain areas in the Middle East as to the, the accords. Uh, and so uh, one needed uh, quite a strong backing uh, to, uh, to, uh, to sign and to make sure that these, uh, these accords uh, 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 came to fruition. Uh, so uh, all in all, uh, I think it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a joint venture, it's a joint effort, uh, and, and we really have to thank here uh, uh, the diplomacy of the United States uh, for moving things forward uh, and arriving uh, at the accords, uh, first and foremost with the United Arab Emirates and then ba with Bahrain, and this was then, as you know, uh, followed by uh, uh, the other chords of uh, with uh, Sudan and uh, finally uh, with uh, uh, with Morocco. Though, if I may, it may diverge a little bit uh, on that as the chief of state protocol of the state of Israel. Uh, Morocco actually did have an office uh, in Israel some two decades ago. Uh, not only an office, but also uh, a house uh, in Savion, which uh, was meant to be for the uh, head of that office. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, uh, the Moroccans have been paying uh, municipal taxes uh, for both uh, the, uh, their offices in Tel Aviv and uh, uh, their uh, house in Savion uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, and the payment actually comes from a bank account uh, in the Gaza Strip. <laughs> but that's just a little anecdote that, uh, that is quite interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move to Ariella. And similar question, I know you were involved commercially um, with especially Jewish um, businesses in the Gulf countries before, prior to the Accords. So what was business like prior to the Accords and how, uh, how new avenues of cultural and commercial investment opened up after the Accords? Sure. So I think there was a, bis a big misconception. Jews were always able to do business in the Gulf. That's still not an issue for the countries who, don't, who are not part of the Abraham Accords. Um, it just, you know, it's Israelis where there was kind of a block. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that the Accords have made Jews in the Western world, some of them more comfortable now doing business. But to your point, I mean, I've been working with them for, for the last six years doing stuff there. Um, it's, it's no secret that, you know, Israel and Dubai alone um, in just the, the, you know, the second half of the year, right after the accords, it brought in $272 million worth of business. Um, I think it's almost every day that you read of a new MOU. We just did for one of our clients, the first ever green tech um, MOU that's signed between the two of them. And it's really every day. We got a university that's, that did one. We have another one that's about to come up. It's not just in kind of the, the financial services space or the tech space. I mean, you're seeing real collaboration across all sectors. I, I had a meeting uh, while, while I was overseas a couple of weeks ago um, with, a, with one of the big hospitals there who asked for, for some thoughts in terms of who would be an appropriate uh, partner for them in terms of Israeli hospitals. This, this is what you're seeing. You're, it's, what's neat to observe is there's a, a new friendship that's, that's growing and people need some guidance, right? Like who, who is the appropriate fit for me in a certain area? And um, there's real networks that are coming to play. So the UA Israel Business Council, for example, was created actually in the summer before there were the accords. Um, the, the two co-founders of the council, um, one is a, a big Israeli uh, hedge fund guy. The other one's actually the, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, they started this together uh, because they had already observed this pattern that there was a lot of business going on and then they brought on some of us who were involved in that um, and and to this day there's there's more than 3,000 members it's a 50 50 split which is really incredible you know you read a lot about the accords on the israel side um, but to be able to say that it's a 50 50 split with emirati participation as well is a big deal and we also started the gulf israel women's council which is not just uae specific we have women from all different gulf countries including some who are not part of the accords um, who really want to foster um, you know friendships that will then become business relationships um, you know as a result of this and i think if if you haven't already seen it it's worth looking it up there's a gentleman in the uae he's a big real estate developer his name is mohammed alabar he owns imar properties um imar is, is the, the big the big real estate uh, folks out there and he put out this video, it was from one of the uh, interviews that he did. And he said, don't come here looking for business, come here and introduce me to your mother. I wanna introduce you to my mother. That's, that's really how business gets done on that side of the world. It's about relationships. And once there's trust that's built, then it becomes a commercial business. And so people like myself who have been there for a decade, you know, people now are looking at us saying, oh, look at these relationships they have, but it was a decade of building that. And I think it's, it's something we say all the time to our Israeli clients who are looking to enter the market that, 
you know, you have to kind of go at their pace. You can't, you can't outrush this. And so uh, some of those are, those are some of the trends we're seeing. And just to go off of, of that last point, um, were there any cultural challenges that were faced in trying to bring together Israeli and yes. clients? A lot of them. Um, and in and, and, and all due respect to, to everybody on the phone, um, I, I will say this, the biggest one that we see is, is ways of working. That's what you'd call it in the business world, right? Um, it's Israelis, there's like a joke that there's no Hebrew word for let's wait and see. There is, you can actually translate it. But Israelis by nature are much more, they're go-getters. They want to do things now, now, now. Israel, and, 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 and it works. It works even when they work with the, with the Western world. But in the Gulf, this is not just the Emirates, in the Gulf in general, it's a very different attitude. Things are a little bit slower pace. And if you try to rush them, they think you're trying to pull one over on them. So we've had a lot of what I refer to often as bull in a China shop moments. You've probably heard that analogy, right? Like um, we have a lot of those where, where somebody will come to us, an Israeli you know, company, and they'll say, we tried to do such and such and, and it, the door got closed in our face. And we'll say, well, what happened? And then, you know, even though we're a PR firm, we do communications obviously. And one of the things that we say to them is, that's a communications challenge. So let's, you know, let's kind of do that together. We've we've actually been um, doing some training sessions for uh, people like small businesses. Um, councils have brought us in to do that. Even different divisions of government in terms of how do you work with one another. Um, those are those are kind of the the big things that are coming up. But there are other things too. I mean, you know, you've probably have all read about you know Hanukkah this year. Like in December time, there was anywhere between fifty to seventy thousand Israelis. Um, who, who visited Dubai, and it was a very different Dubai. I mean, it was, they didn't all come kind of doing their homework in terms of what, what to do. And so many times, you know, we've been called saying, can you help, can you assist? Um, or, you know, we're about to send a delegation. Can you kind of do a training with them of what to expect? But those are a lot of the things that, that we're seeing. And by the way, conversely, we just haven't yet seen a, the, the same like level of, of tourism coming from the Gulf, but they'll get there once Israel opens the borders. There's a lot of interest. Um, but I have a lot of friends who are part of that big uh, delegation. You might've seen the Bahrainis and the Emiratis who visited Israel and they lit the menorah at the Western Wall. You might've seen that. Um, it was through this uh, organization in Sharaka and they're very good friends of mine. And I think what was neat is to hear from them, their perspective about what were some of the, the cultural similarities and differences. But no matter our differences, what's so beautiful about this newfound relationship is both sides really do want to make it work. So you don't see people saying, you know, I'm giving up. You just, you don't see that. That's not part of the rhetoric, which is very exciting. If I may, uh, may I just continue on from what Ariella said? First and foremost, yes, uh, there is uh, quite a different way of focusing uh, on, on how to do business. Uh, and one can see that, of course, uh, when it comes uh, uh, to Israelis who have a tendency to be more uh, shoot off the uh, off the hip, as they say, uh, as opposed to uh, the Gulf uh, culture and the Arab culture, which is uh, slower, uh, get to know you, uh, let's see what's going on. Uh, but uh, there is a difference, and it was mentioned previously uh, by Ariella, that it is more a people-to-people -people, uh, accord. If we compare it to uh, what came in on uh, uh, with the Egyptians and the and the Jordanians, where it was more a leadership down, a top-down uh, sort of uh, focus to uh, to normalization, uh, what seems to be doing and seems to be uh, uh, coming about uh, with, especially with the Emiratis and to a lesser extent uh, with the with Bahrain and. Uh, and more on the tourism side with Morocco, um, uh, it, this people-to-people -people focus uh, is what is so important. I also think that may, that might have been uh, one of the, uh, it's, it's my personal theory, that that might have been uh, one of the problems that we had um, <clears throat> when we started with uh, the peace process in the 1990s, uh, that it, was, it wasn't a, a, a bottom-up approach, and yet it was more a top-down approach. Uh, and I think that the fact that, uh, as was mentioned, so many Israeli tourists, I mean, 130,000 Israelis <clears throat> have had already visited the, uh, uh, the uh, UAE, uh, and that was before we closed our uh, borders uh, and our uh, um, uh, airports. Uh, to uh, to travel, uh, and that was about two months ago, uh, and so the the amount of people visiting is absolutely staggering, uh, and and uh, and why I think we focus in on the United Arab Emirates and Israel because I think they are actually two countries that are very similar. 
Uh, they are two countries that are focused uh, both uh, in the top of uh, the tech technology, technological advances uh, in the world and not only in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, you can see that by uh, the rollout uh, in both of the countries, both Israel and the United Arab Emirates and the rollout of the vaccines uh, have, have been leading the world. Uh, but there have been some very interesting things like 50% uh, stake in Beitar Jerusalem soccer club was actually sold to uh, an Emirati, uh, which is a, a very interesting one because the Beitar Jerusalem soccer uh, uh, club has uh, a rather infamous uh, um, uh, name for, uh, for not really allowing uh, uh, too much uh, inter -co collaboration or cooperation uh, between uh, Jews and Arabs. But uh, this, I think, is a definite wake up call uh, for, uh, for some Israelis. And I think that people are really uh, seeing this normalization co uh, accord as a, a new start uh, to what is going on in the, in the Middle East. And I think that this is really uh, something that is, uh, is, is very good uh, to see. You, know, you, you brought up a good point in terms of the bottom-up approach. I often get asked the question of, you know, when, how, did, how do people know that this was the time? The truth is, is that leaders can always make decisions, but it's up to the people about how warmly they're embraced. And I think what you're seeing here is actually Emiratis and Israelis and Bahrainis too, were ready for this already. Because if they weren't ready, if it wasn't part of the essence of their societies, then their leaders could have done this, but we would not see the collaboration that we're seeing today in both business, social, you know, et cetera. So it speaks also to the people because if they if they weren't ready for it, it doesn't matter that, that this would have happened. And I think to your point earlier, you know, there's examples of Jordan and Egypt where the people weren't ready and you cannot compare the, the, the two, you know, the relationships where they are today. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that was definitely a question I had of why this happened now. So thank you for answering that. Um, Marilyn, would you like to touch on that and just the significance of it happening now as opposed to five years ago, 10 years ago? Um, well, I think it's, it's something that, that, that happens all over the world. Uh, when is it the right time? Is it ever the right time? Uh, and, and what conjunction or what brings about uh, the the meeting of uh, of ideas and the meeting of of peoples and the, and the, and and reaching an accord. Uh, I think that this is is something that uh, I don't know whether there ever is the correct time. Uh, but uh, uh, as Ariella said, uh, I think that uh, people are wanting change. Uh, we're a decade after the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, and uh, we are in a, in a position whereby I think people are a little bit sick and tired of the stagnation that has been going on uh, in the Middle East. I think people have realized that the, the, there are and have been realignments uh, throughout the Middle East and that uh, real pol real politik, as, uh, as the, they call it, is maybe uh, starting to, uh, to push in and to, and, and to move, things, uh, move things forward. Uh, as, as I mentioned beforehand, we had been speaking behind uh, the scenes uh, with a lot of our neighbors. Uh, I think that um, uh, Israel is in a position uh, now in the, uh, uh, in the third decade of the, uh, of the 21st century uh, to actually be a country that is recognized for its technological and medical uh, uh, and uh, advances, uh, the fact that uh, um, uh, there are, and of, uh, we've been known for our agricultural uh, advances in the past. Uh, and I think that we have a lot to offer one another. Uh, it's, not only, it's not only a one-way street, I think it's a definite two-way street. Uh, and and that, and that I think is what is so important. I think over the years, I think, uh, uh, whereas beforehand when Israel maybe uh, talked about things, what we could uh, move forward and how we could move move forward, uh, not everybody saw it as a two way street. And I think that this is uh, the major change that we're seeing now uh, in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I think that uh, the time has it's sort of has uh, the time has gelled or, or, the, or the situation has, has come about that people are, are now willing to, to move forward. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, the, the, some of the countries in the Middle East are beginning to understand 
uh, that oil, uh, some of them for, for longer, that oil is not going to be there for uh, forever and that they've got to uh, refocus their uh, economy, uh, their society uh, on a different uh, on a different footing, on a different level. Uh, and so this, I think, is where Israel can come in. Israel is close. Israel is next door. Uh, Israel has the ability. I mean, it's not uh, for for a long uh, time, uh, people from all over uh, the Arab world uh, without uh, diplomatic relations have come to Israel for medical services. Uh, this is nothing new uh, uh, at the moment. And, and people uh, and the Middle East have seen the advances that exist in Israel. And I think we at long last are learning to uh, put out our hand and to show uh, the countries uh, in the region how uh, important we see it. I mean, we, we have uh, longed to be part of the Middle East. That's where we are, and that's where we have to uh, focus. Um, uh, we have been, uh, we've had to have a sort of island mentality uh, over the decades because we were not always allowed uh, to, to be in direct contact or, or work uh, economically with the uh, uh, the, uh, the countries in the in the neighborhood, but I think that this is a, about to change as well. I think that the change and and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and and these normalization agreements will also bring out a, a change of focus uh, in the countries that we already have agreements with, both in Egypt uh, and in uh, in Jordan, uh, because I don't think they want to be left behind. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I would add to that, uh, uh, and I did peek at some of the questions in, uh, in, the, in the group, uh, I think it will also uh, bring about uh, uh, an, advance, an advancement with, with the Palestinians. And why do I say that? Because it is the Palestinians who have been our neighbors for 70 years, or 73 years and, and longer actually, for, for over a, a century. Uh, and um, they actually know us better than anybody else in the in the in the region. Uh, some of the things about us they don't particularly like, uh, but other things uh, uh, they actually even copy us, uh, even though they won't always uh, say that. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, the Palestinians could definitely be a bridge, uh, and I think that more and more people in Palestinian society are also beginning to understand. Uh, that their uh, close uh, proximity, in fact, it's not even a close proximity. We live uh, more than with neighbors. We're, we're intertwined uh, in the neighborhood, whether we like it or not. Uh, and so I think that what will, will come out of this, what I hope that will come out of this, is that the, the focus of the Palestinians uh, will start to change as well. When they realize that their brothers and their brethren uh, in the Arab world are beginning to uh, uh, move uh, towards maybe where they, sh they should have been uh, some decades uh, ago. Uh, uh, but they can still be there. I mean, uh, they, they know Israeli technology, they know Israeli people, they speak Hebrew, uh, a vast majority of them. So they can definitely be that bridge. Uh, and uh, let's hope that this is where uh, things are going to, uh, they're going to go uh, in, in the future. But uh, the Palestinian leadership has to uh, also uh, change uh, some, of, uh, some of its rhetoric uh, that they use. I, I, I think that, uh, if you look at Israeli history, um, we have uh, definitely moved when, uh, when the rhetoric has been changed. Um, we have been very forthcoming, both with Egypt and with Jordan over the decades, uh, when they have put out their hand in peace. And I think that uh, this is, uh, is something that uh, just might be... Um, uh, uh, or might bring about an opening also on, on the other level, because uh, uh, the Palestinians are also, of course, uh, very well uh, uh, supported uh, by uh, especially the Gulf countries. Uh, and, and I think that this is, is something that will definitely manage, uh, or I hope will manage to, to move things forward. Sorry, sorry, I stole one of the questions that was asked there. Well, if, if I can add to that, I think one of the elements here, which impacts both Palestinians as well as the Middle East in general, is there's real economic opportunity here. So, you know, at the end of the day, when we're coming out of COVID, the, the entire world 
was financially and economically impacted by COVID. What better time than to reopen markets and say on top of that, now you have access to new markets. So for Emiratis, they now have access to Israel. For Bahrain, now they have access to, you know, to Israel. But Israel now has access to four markets, which is pretty incredible, right? So I think when you, when, you, know, when, when you talk about some of the challenges that, that the Palestinians face, a lot of it goes back to economics. And so if, they're, if their cousins, okay, are now working with the Israelis and there's gonna be um, businesses that are developed as a result, they will probably feel more comfortable working for those businesses, which in turn will create more economic opportunities. And when there's more economic opportunities, they tend, people in general, it doesn't matter your race or ethnicity, you tend to be happier people. And so they'll probably be better, you know, better or, or more interested, let's say, in coming, in coming to the table once they see that this will actually benefit them and in a tangible way. And I think that that's also part of the answer in terms of, you know, people always say who's next and, and you know, how far is the, you know, are these accords gonna extend? The reality is, is we're living in a day and age where Everybody needs to band together to come up with a solution to COVID and everybody has to come together and figure out how we rehabilitate our economies. And what we're seeing here is that this does seem to be part of the secret sauce to doing both because when Israel partnered with the Emirates to bring, you guys probably remember this, they brought those two uh, Etihad flights, right, of, of aid for the, for the Palestinians. Unfortunately, they did reject those two planes, but the point is they worked together and that was before the Accords. And now we're seeing the economic benefits in terms of business and again, like I said, Dubai alone, not even all of the Emirates. And, and you know, I always say the, the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, it's like the United States of America. There are multiple Emirates, like there are multiple states. And so just the numbers alone from Dubai and Israel being 272 million. And that was just between, you know, when the accords were signed in, in, in September through the end of the year. Think about that's basically a quarter, a little bit more. Think about what that could be over the course of a full year for all of the Emirates and then how it now will, um, will, will kind of metastasize throughout all of these countries. And I think it's an amazing opportunity and it speaks to everybody. Yeah, so we briefly touched on um, COVID and effect on Palestine. And as Marilyn mentioned earlier, Israel has received international praise for its excellent vaccine response. Already over 54% of its population has been vaccinated. However, um, they have taken a pretty slow response with Palestinians. Um, only certain Palestinians with work visas have been vaccinated by the Israeli government. And just yesterday, Palestine received 40,000 doses from the UAE. Does Israel have a duty to vaccinate Palestinian people? And how does this action by the UAE affect Israeli citizens? Marilyn, if you'd like to start. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a two pronged uh, uh, question. And I, I would say uh, that Israel is in a situation of damned if you do and damned if you don't. Uh, and I'll try and explain to, to you why. Uh, first and foremost, in the Oslo Accords, it, it specifically stipulates that the Palestinian Authority uh, has control of the uh, health of the Palestinians uh, uh, living uh, uh, in uh, both uh, Judea, Samaria and the Gaza Strip or the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, and uh, they are uh, in charge of their health system. Uh, now, uh, in the beginning, uh, the Palestinian Authority said they do not want Israeli involvement. Uh, and they joined uh, the uh, accords that were set up by the World Health Organization and the United Nations uh, in uh, uh, signing up for uh, vaccinations that were uh, uh, were about to uh, were uh, going to be uh, 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 given out or dissimulated by by the other countries or by or by the or international organizations. Sorry. Um, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, some very interesting people uh, around the world started saying, "Oh well, you know, Israel, as the occupying power, has to uh, make sure that the health of the uh, Palestinian people uh, is is brought on par with the, that of uh, 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 of what is going on in Israel." Uh, now, uh, uh, you know, it's not always uh, so, uh, so easy to, uh, to be involved in a system that you are not controlling and that you don't uh, deal with daily. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, Israel uh, is dealing uh, with its population, which includes uh, everybody in its population. Uh, and uh, uh, the focus is, is such that up till now, uh, the, the, your numbers uh, have, have to be uh, 
uh, upped a little bit, Zach. It's now more than 60% of, of, of Israel's uh, population of over 16 year olds who have uh, received uh, two uh, vaccinations. Um, uh, we have also, as you rightly uh, mentioned, started uh, uh, vaccinating uh, the, uh, uh, well, we've offered the vaccinations because we're not forcing anybody to, uh, to receive the vaccination, uh, but of the 110 to 120,000 Palestinians uh, that work in Israel daily uh, have been offered uh, the ability to get uh, the, uh, the vaccinations and there is a campaign, ongoing campaign at the moment uh, to do so. Uh, we have also been uh, allowing in the vaccinations, of course, from uh, from uh, other countries and and uh, the few uh, countries that have been giving uh, vaccinations. So uh, I think that uh, we are seeing uh, more and more uh, Palestinians who are being vaccinated. I think there is no other country in the world that wants to see the Palestinians uh, vaccinated quicker than us, uh, because, as I said, we live uh, one next to the other and uh, we work together. Uh, or at least a large percentage of them work together with us. Uh, so we definitely do want uh, the populations that are uh, connected with us to be vaccinated. So, uh, you know, it, it does take time. Uh, uh, all in all, if I'm not mistaken, uh, some uh, nine and a half million vaccinations have already been given out uh, to, uh, to the Israeli uh, population. Uh, and I presume uh, that once, uh, uh, once this has, uh, we have reached uh, uh, herd immunity, uh, there will be a little bit more uh, vaccinations to go, uh, to go around uh, and even for our neighbors. But this is a, dis a political decision. And as you know, uh, we are going into another uh, round of elections, our fourth elections on the 23rd of March. Uh, and so, uh, you know, sometimes bureaucratic decisions take a little bit longer uh, to, to move forward. But, uh, but I definitely think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, vaccinating or allowing uh, 120,000 Palestinians to be vaccinated, that's 240,000 uh, uh, vials of, uh, uh, of, the, of the vaccine. Uh, I think uh, we, we can't really be faulted uh, that much for, for what is going on uh, in the Palestinian Authority because they uh, have their own leaders and uh, their own leaders uh, are supposed to look after their health, uh, their health needs. But we are there to try and help and move things along, of course. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will be seeing uh, herd immunity in the whole region and not only uh, in Israel in the not too distant future. Next, I'd like to move to audience Q&A. So there is a question about security concerns, specifically with Iran and the, the Shia um, movement associated with Iran. Um, so how important were security concerns for both countries in getting the accord signed? And how do you envision the two countries will collaborate on protecting their mutual interests? Ariel, if you'd like to take this one first. Uh, well, it's probably more of a diplomacy question, um, but just in terms of what I hear, um, I think everybody recognizes that, that Israel really is a strong military power, and I think that everybody's excited to, to be uh, in partnership with them, to have each other's backs, and I think that, you know, I think whether it's that, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, I mean, Miro mentioned that there's this, there's this threat of the, of the oil running out. There really are a few existential threats that, threats that the Gulf is facing. One of which is obviously Iran, which we all know. The other one is um, the, the point that he made right, about uh, about gas running out. So I think that you know I can't tell you how how high up on the list that was, but I I think that everybody around the world um, recognizes the impressive military uh, you know power and position that Israel has, and I think anybody would want to be their friend when they have a common enemy. That's that's how I would answer it from an outsider's perspective. But honestly, it's it's really probably more of a, a diplomacy question. So I'll turn it over. Yeah, well, uh, we we do see uh, more eye to eye with uh, the people on the southern shores of the of the Gulf than uh, we see on those in the northern shores of the Gulf. Uh, but uh, yes, there is that uh, that uh, 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 joint uh, threat uh, that we we see uh, both Israel and uh, and uh, uh, the majority of the Gulf states uh, see Iran uh, as. Uh, 
uh, a fomenter of terrorism uh, as uh, a power that uh, is a very, very strong uh, uh, regional power uh, that uh, is uh, trying to uh, get nuclear weapons and that is uh, definitely focused on the destruction of the state of Israel that they have said openly time and time again. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, they would like to improve uh, or, uh, or gain uh, uh, a lot of uh, access and, 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 uh, and focus on their neighbors uh, uh, south of them as well. I mean, you can see uh, Iranian involvement both in Iraq and in Syria and in Lebanon and in Yemen. Uh, and it's uh, it's not a, a power to be dealt lightly with, um, and uh, and I think that uh, when you are living in the region with Iran, uh, it's different than being uh, uh, ten or twenty thousand miles away uh, and not having to deal with them daily. Uh, they are definitely. Uh, a power to be reckoned with, and they are definitely trying to uh, force their uh, focus uh, on uh, the countries in the Middle East, and one can understand uh, why uh, there would be a, a joint interest uh, to uh, focus in uh, on uh, some of the problems that Iran is causing uh, in the region. Uh, so, so yes, I think that that is uh, one of the, the reasons why uh, there is that interest uh, uh, in, um, uh, in signing agreements with Israel and being in contact with Israel. Uh, there is no uh, joint uh, defense agreement that we have uh, with, uh, with the Gulf countries. The, the, the defense agreements that, that exist are actually with the United States and not with us. Uh, and the military bases are, uh, are uh, of, uh, from the United States. Uh, so uh, I can't see uh, that ever uh, happening uh, with Israel, and, and that's not the way uh, we focus. And we're not. Uh, I don't think there's any interest of of Israel. We're uh, to to have any any outside base uh, outside of uh, of the state of Israel. But uh, I, I definitely think that uh, there is a, a very important. Um, uh, there are quite a few important uh, points uh, that we see eye to eye on, uh, and I think that this has definitely uh, moved things uh, forward. We, we definitely see uh, Iran as uh, a major instigator of uh, uh, instability and uh, violence and terrorism uh, in our region uh, and uh, even further afield. Ariel, uh, earlier you mentioned kind of how your commercial, through your commercial work, you saw public opinion already moving towards peace and normalizing of relations. And so um, one audience question is, although the people of certain Middle East countries are ready for change, some people like the Sudanese aren't. How will Israel and Sudan go about sedating the grievances and resentment the Sudanese feel for Israel to make sure there's willingness to go forward, not only from the leadership side, but also the civilian one? Sure, so it's a good question. Um, I will tell you, mo most of my experience is really more on the Gulf side, but what I will tell you is um, this was not an overnight thing. I think sometimes people think that it's just like, I don't know, they, the Emiratis woke up and it was April 13th. And they're like, you know, let's do something. That's not how this works. And I think it's really important that people understand there was a process. And part of the process is actually, it's a process of teaching and tolerance about different um, religions, right? So if you take a look, and in the Emirates in the 2019, they named the year of tolerance. And that was the year that the Pope came, which was a very big deal. Um, and when the Pope came, they actually had rabbis come and speak at this conference that was associated with it. And that was the year that the Emirates, I actually have a copy in the other room, but um, the Emirates put out a book of all the different religions that are in the Emirates. And this was all part of a process. And so I think, you know, Bahrain is actually the, uh, the only Gulf country with its own indigenous Jewish community um, where really, really, it's a vibrant community, they're part of the fabric of society. And I think that people have to understand it's a process. First, we have to teach that we have, you know, Muslims and Jews have things in common. And then through commonality, that's how friendship is built. And that's how friendship, you know, you have to water that friendship and then it blooms into something bigger. And I think that when it comes to, you know, a country like Sudan, and I'm sure, you know, God willing, there'll be others that are gonna have similar profiles. Uh, the way to do it is really through education and to, to show what unites us and what brings us together. Um, and then it will grow into something more. And the other thing is, I think, what the Emirates has seen, at least what I've heard from my friends who are Emiratis, is that they also acknowledge that 
you know, a lot of maybe their past feelings stemmed from media coverage of Israel, um, which maybe they didn't always read the, the most, um, the most balanced media. And so a lot of them, you'll hear them say things like, wow, I didn't realize Israel does this because they had these, mis these misconceptions. And so my hope is that uh, the Sudanese will, will take the opportunity to kind of educate their society and their public about that all, all that Israel has to offer, not just them, but the region in general. And I think that, like I said earlier, there's this domino effect with the accords, but I hope even outside of the accords, and to tie in a little bit with what Mayron said in terms of, you know, there's potential opportunity for this to also impact Jordan and Egypt. I always say that there's kind of two Middle Easts right now. There's the Middle East, and then there's the new Middle East. And the new Middle East is based on providing opportunities for everybody and saying, let's, let's knock down these barriers and let's come together. And we're seeing that with some of the big players in the region, Israel, the UAE, um, Bahrain, Morocco. And I, I really hope that you start to see more more countries come into that way of thinking as we have leaders that are now coming you know we have a new generation of leaders that are coming up in a lot of these countries many of whom were actually educated out in the west so they they they, they went to school with jews they they've done business with jews and there there's there's really a change that's going on i think sudan is a little bit unique to the points that you mentioned but i think that with with good communication and with good education we can absolutely get there so we just have a couple more minutes. Um, so if we could answer this question a little more briefly, uh, you touched on this, Ariella, before, but do you believe the Abraham Accords will open the door to more agreements of a similar nature between Israel and other countries in the Gulf in the greater MENA region? And so maybe if you can mention a couple of those. 100%. And it's not a question of if I think, I know, I know it's going to happen. Um, and I'm not saying that just because I'm, I'm an optimist. I've, I've, um, I've participated in, in conversations. I think, look, things, things went on hold. They went a little bit on ice. Um, with the, because of what was going on here in the U.S. in terms of our elections, right? You know, this was really driven, um, you know, from the Trump administration. A lot of countries wanted to kind of see what was going to happen, and then you know, what's the impact. But there's no question that it's going to happen. And and I mean, listen, MBS, you know, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has been quoted in the media um, as saying that he knows he needs Israel as part of his Vision 2030, which is like the Saudi plan to rehabilitate their economy um, and to move it away from being so dependent on just oil. So there's no question that it's going to happen. It's it's just a question of time. When is it going to happen? But it will happen. Aaron, if you'd like to take about 60 seconds. Uh, well, yes, I, I definitely do think, and I agree with uh, Ariella, that uh, uh, we will see uh, more um, uh, agreements. I hope that we will. Uh, I think the new. It always takes a new administration time to to get uh, its act together, uh, and of course, this administration has to deal first and foremost with uh, the uh, the problems of uh, the pandemic, uh, and so it's very understandable that uh, they fo uh, the Biden administration is focusing, of course, first and foremost on um, uh, internal uh, policy, uh, and uh, it just might take a little bit more time to focus in. But I think it's definitely. Uh, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, points uh, from the previous administration that this administration, the new one, uh, would definitely like to continue. And I think it's it's good, not only for the Middle East, I think it's good for the world, uh, uh, for the world. And I think uh, uh, that is that is where we uh, we would definitely like to uh, to focus in on. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, um, Maron and Ariella for the wonderful conversation. Thank you for all the attendees for coming to us today. Sorry we had to cut a little short. There's just another webinar hopping on here in a few minutes, but I hope everyone enjoys the sunshine in Boston, wherever you are, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all.